Okay, all right. So uh, let us resume. It's uh, my great pleasure to have our uh, to introduce our next speaker, Colin Dixon. So Colin has a very interesting story. Um, I remember his work on both Home OS, like an operating system for all home devices, and uh, I think a fancier name today would be the Internet of Things. And I had this other paper that uh, argued for the end to the middle, so uh, a more principled architecture to in introduce middle boxes in, uh, in the network, or rather to push out that and uh, rely on network and software to deal with all this crazy processing in the, in that happens in the network. Uh, since then, uh, uh, Colin um, has moved uh, to IBM Research first, if I remember yeah. correctly, for a while. <laughs> and uh, now he's uh, uh, with Brocket. Uh, Colin is actually the chair of Open Daylight's Technical Steering Committee these days, so he contributes to one of the largest platforms for doing uh, open source software defined networking. And he's also a principal engineer at Brocket. So uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, having Colin giving us a talk about the state of open source SDN as viewed by uh, the eyes of industry. So without further ado, Colin, the floor is yours. Sure. So, um, so yeah, so that was pretty good. You actually, I think you gave one of my slides, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, the, uh, but um, uh, this talk is probably going to be different from the rest of the talks today because I have almost no concrete technical content. Um, what I have is a lot of problems um, and and some thoughts about where I would go and attack them. And so maybe that will make it the best talk of the day. Maybe it'll make it the worst talk of the day. Um, uh, but like I, I have a ton, ton of problems, some of which I believe should be interesting programming languages problems, some of which Sriram has told me I should stop talking about as programming languages problems because I don't know what I'm talking about. But you know, I'm going to try anyway. So. Um, basically, the outline is I'm going to tell you what I know a lot about, which is sort of who I am, why I'm here, a brief history of SDN from my perspective, which is a little bit different from what people have been talking about. Um, and then I'm going to talk about sort of a mix of problems that I have and sort of dive into some ideas for how to solve them. Um, and most of my ideas about how to solve things are systems-y ideas, not programming languages yet ideas. And my experience is that that usually means they almost work most of the time, as opposed to do work all of the time. Uh, and so I'm hoping that people will see some of this and say, that seems like a really trivial application of this and maybe a paper, and come help me solve these problems. Or better yet, that seems like a place for me to take my programming languages knowledge and go have real impact on actual people building real products in relatively short periods of time. So um, that would be fantastic. Uh, so this, I put this up here just to give you an idea and feel free of, what, of what, where I've been and sort of my background is a little bit different from I think most of the other people that are here. I got my PhD at the University of Washington, went to IBM Research, now I'm at Open Daylight. And so I basically have moved from pure academic grad student to sort of research lab, you know, person trying to pretend to be an academic and working on some products to giving up and just admitting that I'm going to work on open source projects and try and ship real product. Um, and I've learned a lot of really interesting things in the process, and I don't know where I'm going to end up when I go back and sort of pop out of this, this thing. But if you have questions about sort of how you transition through this, and especially how open source makes this radically different, I'd love to talk about that too, sort of in a meta, meta level. Um, okay, so a really, really, really brief history of SDN, so that way um, and, uh, is, you know, right, there were original papers, I think 4D is what I would call the start of SDN. I don't know if anybody else has, if, if this is sort of the idea that you want to break up your network into different planes, centralize some of them, decentralize others. Um, it's amazing to go back and reread the original 4D paper um, uh, 12 years later and discover how much of this stuff, or I guess 11 years later now, uh, how much of this stuff was in there and we just didn't quite get it yet. Or maybe everybody else did and I'm just slow. But I, I feel like that's sort of revealing. I basically went through and we ended up with sort of getting open flow around 2008. Um, and then, you know, since then, you know, there are more papers on SDN than we ever got with DHTs, which should scare the crap out of everybody because <laughs> DHTs <laughs> fell apart around that time. But, you know, I, I think there's some reality there and I'll talk a little about that later. Um, but really, I think the interesting part about SDN and why I think it's had such a transformative impact on the industry has not been the technical ideas, although they're fine. Um, and, and some of them are really cool and really innovative. Um, the real reason is, I, I think, because it's been the first time sort of modular, open source, reusable, easily found, somewhat decently written software really came to bear on networking. And so what happened is you saw 30 or 40 years worth of shift in how we think about, how we build, how we operate, how we run networks come in about eight years. Um, and, and that's continuing to happen. And this is, and sort of open source software, I think, has had, and this is just the controllers, by the way. 
Um, I think that's what this is. Um, there is, you know, if you expand this to things other than controllers, there is huge numbers of things. I'll talk a little bit later. But just the amount of open source code available in order to go pick up and build, as compared to having to buy a box from Cisco or from, or from whoever else, um, has radically changed the way things work. And I think that has more to do than anything about uh, breaking apart the control plane from the data plane, about open flow. Like, like that's all happenstance. I think this is the real transition we're watching, which is the shift to basically having modular software that is usually widely available in open source. You do have a switch in the list. Uh, do I? Open vSwitch. Open vSwitch, I do. Oh, that's that. Yeah, I, I felt you had to put that if you're trying to talk about open source SDN. Um, I thought they were all controllers, but to be fair, I was making these slides. Um, so I spent most of yesterday when I was leaning to be making my slides in a hospital in the Czech Republic. My son is fine, so you know. But but the result is that these slides are not as polished as I would have liked them to be. His son is sick. <laughs> 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 just, just <laughs> so okay, I, I have this really fancy diagram I made like five years ago. How how traditional SD is. Actually, I made this slide when I was when I was talking about how SD what SDN was. And I've come to believe that this is what SDN, what SDN was. Um, and this is sort of traditional OpenFlow SDN. Do people want to go through? I, I can actually, I have a, do people want to see how OpenFlow actually works in practice with a controller? How many people understand how like, you know, OpenFlow works with a controller and how the packet ends happen? OK, it's worth going through this once. Um, so um, modern switches look basically like this. Um, they have a control plane CPU on the switch. They have a switch chip underneath it. And the switch chip is designed to do um, essentially incredibly fast lookups in a table. In this case, it's think about it as MAC address and what port to go out. And they can do this at line rate for arbitrary size packets. Basically, you know, small packets you can get through, they can do it. And they can do it for all the ports at all times. And there is a control plane CPU, which is usually an ARM or you know, x86 in newer switches thing that actually goes out and it's responsible for doing some of the population of these tables, but not a ton of the population of these tables. A lot of it's done actually through events in the switch chip, but the idea is like routing, right? so Mac learning is typically done in the switch chip. Routing, where you actually exchange like OSPF or ISS, ISS or BGP messages, is all handled here and then eventually compiles down into tables. And so a traditional switch, when a packet comes in, um, it goes through, it does a lookup in the table, and it comes back out, and this is showing a fictitious switch in which you're still doing Mac learning in the control plane, which they used to do, but they no longer do. Um, you would actually see that that switch came from OA, and you would actually go install this you know, table which says, if you see something to OA, send it to port one, because that's where it came from. That's Mac learning. And in reality, that would happen in the switch chip in modern switches. But you know, the general idea is this thing populates a lot of these tables, and you have a very fast lookup. Um, the problem with this is it's all contained on this one switch. You can't change it. It's sold to you by your vendor. Um, you can't really do anything new or innovative. It, it's, you know, it is however it came. Um, SDN, the idea, or at least, is to decouple the control in the data planes. So the idea is to actually move most of this control plane functionality up into a controller. And the way this typically works is that you know, the control planes get smaller. Most of the content goes up into the, uh, into the controller. And so in practice, um, if you had a packet that comes in here, it comes in and there's no rule to forward to the destination OC. So when there's a table miss, you punt it up to the controller. Not everything is built this way, but most things in OpenFlow are built this way. When you get a miss, pop it up to the controller. So it sends the packet up to the control plane, out to the controller. The controller usually has some more global view of the world, including knowing where this host is. In this case, it's going to say, I know that that's on port four, it actually goes and adds a rule to forward it and then sends the packet back out into the network where um, it actually it explicitly tells it where to send it for the first one. Usually that's the rule to do it for the rest. This is how OpenFlow works. Um, th this is OpenFlow rules. The packets going up are called packet ins. The packets going out are called packet outs. Sometimes you can have more than one table. That's really OpenFlow in one slide. Um, and if you're not a networking person, it's worth knowing that at least once. Um, I, I, good to point out, like it doesn't do DPI for you. It doesn't do. I guess I, I've, I, I can't tell you how many papers I've reviewed where you know, like they say, and we use OpenFlow to do something in the network, which by the name anything programmable that we could imagine running from the network, we'll assume OpenFlow can do. Also, don't read the OpenFlow spec and assume that what the OpenFlow spec says is what hardware actually does, because it doesn't. Um, <laughs> especially for OpenFlow later than 1.0. 1.0, you might actually get lucky. Anything else, like switches, don't do it. Is it easy to compliance test? Are there practical ways of compliance test? Because there are practical reasons no. for it. 
I, so the answer is the, uh, the Open Networking Foundation is who maintains OpenFlow. Um, they have a set of compliance tests, but the compliance tests are, well, there's a couple of things. One of them, uh, so first of all, they're not particularly interesting, which is to say the compliance tests, the set of the OpenFlow spec after 1.0, which is mandatory, is small enough to make compliance testing somewhat weird. And so instead of what they've done is they've invented characteristic sets of functions and sort of tried to do it. Um, and then the other thing is that um, they've basically failed to give any, um, nobody has any incentive to go through the compliance tests, so the other problem. Um, and so uh, nobody's done it. I think HP and then a bunch of the startups are the only companies that have ever put anything up for compliance testing because there's only downside, right? Like, at least right now for a company, like I wouldn't, Brocade hasn't put our switches up for compliance testing um, and I'm not in control of that, so don't blame me. But like essentially the logic I was given was, look, we are not, you know, we sell few enough switches that use OpenFlow that we're not gonna make a huge amount of money by getting them compliance tested. And if we come out worse than Cisco or worse than somebody else in that metric, you know, that's gonna cause us significant damage even for people who don't wanna use OpenFlow. And so people don't. So people who buy them and have have a, a software that assumes a certain functionality of OpenFlow, a certain version of OpenFlow. Um, how do they discover that? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that question, but maybe we can take it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's um, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. So I, I spent a lot of my life in working for hardware companies, IBM and then Bro and Brocade, where I sort of have a deep understanding of what the switches actually do and trying to build controllers for them. Um, and so I'm happy to talk about the details. The, the short answer is it doesn't work. It, n none of this works. Um, that like the, the hardware portability aspect of SDN has been an utter and complete failure to this day. Um, that's the short version. Uh, unless you're using OpenFlow 1.0 and 1.0 only, or you know your hardware in advance, which isn't going to be portability. So what I've actually spent most of my last time, my last year working on is sort of what I call modern inclusive SDN. And this is less about OpenFlow and more about generically, I want, it, it's more NMS 2.0, network management systems done with some sanity to them. So it used to be that you could buy these products from like CA and IBM, and they would go and they would talk to the CLI and SNMP of all your boxes, they would discover them, they would pull the topology out, and they almost worked about 30% of the time, and they were kind of horrible, and they were incredibly expensive to maintain, and nobody made any money off of them. Um, the hope is with a little bit more standardization, we can build cooler things. So traditional network today, you know, a traditional box, you have the actual hardware, you have a control plane, you have a management plane, which nobody ever talks about, but the management plane, if there's anything more complicated and more annoying to deal with than the control plane. Um, and, and, and then not only that, you have you know, multiple different vendors providing each with their own stack. Um, so it's not just that you have multiple different stacks doing their own things, you have, you know, they're, they're programmed in different ways. Um, and this basically, almost all the hard problems in networking are, can't be solved in this model because they're fundamentally about multiple different boxes and they're fundamentally about delivering new innovation, which you can't do if you have very locked into a vertical silo. Um, I, I, I've come to believe most of the problems in most areas are at least partially economic, and so I talk a little bit about that more than technology, but such is life. Um, so instead what you do is you do what was talked about earlier, which is you sort of pull out a lot of this <coughs> logic from the boxes. But you'll note that I left the control plane on one of these boxes, and that's because I, in, in modern SDN, really, I'm gonna argue the control plane might actually stay on the box. The management plane is, might actually be what you logically centralize um, in the longer run. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that, um, but, and I can get into them later. But uh, then you basically replace it with a logically centralized controller. It speaks industry standard uh, control and management protocols. Um, uh, it uses standard modeling languages. You can think of OpenFlow as having an implicit modeling language for flow mods, sort of. It's fine, um, and it exposes sort of northbound APIs. The one thing which I'll add is that, you know, essentially the protocol that seems to be coming to rise for controlling the management plane is NetConf and Yang. Um, and NetConf is the protocol, and Yang is the data description language for it. Um, and so if, if you're a programming languages person look, interested in getting involved in networking, it turns out that there is a language and a protocol that describes has sort of ways to go manipulate, which is it's a data description language, but it has the operations to manipulate that data description, the, the instantiated versions of the data description, which are, I think, interesting, but I, you know, having, not being a PL person myself, I, I can only look at it and go, it seems like there should be fancy things that I should have here, and I don't have them right now. Um, uh, but that's sort of the standard protocol, and you can think of NetConf and Yang as sort of the new version of SNMP, but they are seeming to get more attention and likely to avoid a lot of the problems SNMP ran into. 
Um, uh, this is just, uh, so these are just, I pulled out five acquisitions that I can remember off the top of my head in the last three years, starting with Nasira, which sort of started this whole process of SDN really taking off in industry. Um, uh, the scary thing is we're looking at, like just pulling out the big names, I think we're running about a billion dollars a year in acquisitions for the last three years in the networking industry, in SDN. So this is like not, not little, this is a really huge thing that's going on, at least in terms of the cash outlay people are making. Um, uh, and then it's actually deployed in production today. I, I pulled out the one example where Brocades is running. We actually are the controller that runs AT&T's new bandwidth on demand service in the US. So you can actually go to a web portal if you're an AT&T business customer and say, I want 10 gigs of connectivity between these two sites for the next hour. And they will provision that link for you and actually make it happen across their network. And that's running using NetConf and Yang to control their routing infrastructure to set up tunnels. And the orchestration is done using um, uh, uh, using the Brocade Viata controller based on top of Open Daylight. So I mean, this is, but I mean, there's lots of other people. I would say, you know, Google, Microsoft, I think you have more representatives, like people that are deploying real SDN, but this is actually running, it's not like pie in the sky. This is, um, and I think if you include things that aren't just open flow, it gets much bigger than that. So this is just sort of the, the brief history of SDN. SDN has gone from like sort of wild, crazy academic idea that I think a lot of people would have bet on failing to, you know, getting tons of attention, running about, you know, a billion dollars a year in acquisitions. Um, and in the process of sort of meeting reality, it's changed a lot. Um, it's not just about the control plane from the data plane anymore. It's about a lot more than that. Um, it's not just about open flow anymore. Um, and I really think it's more actually about this rise of open source software and the ability to share ideas and ways of managing networks than it is about the actual technical details of separating control plane, data plane, and open flow and all of that stuff. Um, Sorry. In this your more inclusive definition of SDN, right? Mm -hmm. do, do you assume that basically in this, you know, in the controller, the open source, uh, open source controller, you can really use a mul multiple different uh, protocols for uh, yes. controlling, uh, and this is still manageable in terms of uh, you know the complexity of the system. I, no. I, I, know, I know this is it, yes, I, and I no. know this is the, the goal of open light, but yeah, yeah. So, so, so the answer is yes. The glib answer is yes and no. So yes, it has multiple southbounds. No, it's not manageable in terms of complexity. The more realistic answer is that you know you can get incremental management and complexity for incremental effort. So you know there is a common. So you know getting the basic things together, like the ability to pull the topology out of your entire network and get all of your devices, despite the fact that you speak multiple different protocols, is pretty straightforward. Which is we have a model of the topology in Open Daylight. The getting to the point at which you can actually actuate control in a meaningful way. Um, across all of your devices, right? The more specific you want to get about what needs to happen, the less likely you are to actually have the knobs <coughs> to be able to go make that happen on real hardware in your network. Um, and um, so, yeah, so it's you're not going to get the open flow level of here is the path I want you to take through my network. Although, increasingly, that's becoming more true. Um, it's, it, but it's not only you know different protocols in terms of you know the, the, how they are defined and how they work. But <coughs> it's more regarding the abstraction of the hardware they propose, which may be not completely consistent, and then this will create a lot of problems in the way you create a northbound and a lot of problem in the definition of the applications, right? So that's yeah, yeah. a real problem, right? So that's why probably some more like, homogeneity in, in the southbound. There is a lot, right? There is, essentially, if you embrace the diversity at the bottom end of the networking stack today, the probability that you will get a nice clean abstraction at the top is zero. Um, and you have to sort of pick between um, whether you want to try and maintain the abstraction at the top and, and, and limit yourself to the sort of hardware you can program. Or what we're trying to do in open daylight is to try and leave the water bottom as almost as wide open as you can and try and find the abstractions. I think this is kind of like what I mean, this is essentially how POSIX evolved, right? We tried to, and, and I think somebody was telling me, um, yeah, um, that, that there is no POSIX compliant file system, that they actually ran the tests. I think it's a, a nil? Yeah. You were saying there is no POSIX compliant file system. It doesn't actually exist. But, there, but the, I think, you know, POSIX came about because they basically, a whole bunch of people worked on this same problem for a while, and they found what the commonalities were, and then built the abstractions from there, which is, very different from how I think most people have been approaching SDN, which is trying to find the abstractions at the top and push it down. Time will tell who is going to win. I think historically speaking, um, the data doesn't point very much towards top-down design of abstractions. Um, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, I can give you a bunch of examples, but Android would be a really good one of something that is just an epic and complete disaster at the beginning and has somehow come around to dominate the ecosystem um, despite that. Uh, I think that you can see that a bunch of times. And so I think that 
just trying to throw spaghetti at the wall for a while and see what the patterns it forms is, is a more sane strategy than you might imagine. Um, uh, anyway, here's a whole bunch of different open source projects. The really point I wanted to make is sort of, if you've got almost any layer in the stack of something you would build in a product or build in a network, there's open source pieces to it. And what I'm doing this is to take away any excuse you have for not building real things. There are open source projects out there that are not that hard to download and get and work with at every layer of the stack. So if you want to prototype features from top to bottom, do anything you want. There is no excuse for not doing it in real, actual things if you want to. I mean, you, you can. I mean, certainly I was an academic for a long time. You can decide to take the path of least resistance to a paper. But if you want to have actual impact, um, the path to have impact in the networking industry has been radically lowered in the last five years. And it's sort of because you can go from a hardware, the firmware on the hardware, to you know the controllers, to the orchestration systems at the top. Um, so I'm going to skip. Do people know? I mean, Open Daylight is basically a controller. It's a big controller. has a lot of southbound protocols. There's a whole bunch of different ideas. The really the only thing that Open Daylight has that I think is interesting is this, which is it has about 350 to 400 developers from about 40 different organizations trying to work on improving it and build products out of it. Um, and that will, if pointed in the right direction, that destroys things. Um, it just it, you can, you can if you can get people to agree on a direction to go and a way to move, it will do amazing things. And the interesting part is, I think for this room, is that we have a whole lot of problems and um, I haven't seen a whole lot of people yelled at for bringing crazy ideas to the table and to try and solve them. Uh, we already have projects around Nemo, which I think you'll hear about later in the, uh, in the talk. We have a project that's looking to bring NetIDE, which includes support for Paretic. Um, and we have the Maple project, actually. Maple people are trying to bring their implementation on top of this. We have internally a couple other language approaches. Um, uh, Group-based policy, which is sort of Cisco, a Cisco language for in your language. So there's lots of things going on here from all sorts of different angles. And so coming in and trying to help us figure out how to solve problems, if you actually have the time, you have the, I mean, this is sort of, we're watching Linux grow up in the networking space. It's an opportunity to participate and do really cool things. And I would love to have help. Um, blah, 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 blah. We have a whole bunch of releases. Um, I'm really glad that we didn't double the amount of code in the second release. Um, I really like to see the code go down after this, but no, that's no, you can never get rid of code. You can only add code. But I at least like to keep it around two, two and a half million lines of code. Um, uh, but it's sort of crazy the amount which it's grown. Um, um, uh, do people actually, do people want to see the architecture of open daylight? I can show it to you. It's not, anyway, so I'll, I'll do it quickly. We have, the core of open daylight is a model driven service abstraction layer. Um, and basically we have three different ways of things for interacting. We have a da centralized data store, we have notifications, and we have RPCs. Um, and they're all defined via Yang. Um, and so Yang is an, it basically uses interface description language. And since RPCs are basically just data in and data out, and notifications are just data with a source, it's all data. Um, every, so it's all about data modeling. Um, uh, we also have... Um, uh, we've implemented it in, uh, we've clustered it at, uh, to the point which, you know, we used Raft and we actually built a strongly consistent cluster, although we're looking at trying to relax the strongly consistent part um, in order to, and one of the things that I really like to know about, um, and I don't know if there's any programming languages techniques here, although um, I kind of liked Erwin, is if I'm going to have different parts of my controller have different consistency models for their data, how do I reason about what the final, cons the behavioral consistent C model is? Um, which is, I'd really like to have my, top, and I, I can talk about this a little bit, I'd really like to have my topology be eventually consistent so that I can update it even if I'm split. But I would like to have the events, which I, how I process that topology to be consistent and well ordered so that way I don't diverge in terms of my behavior. And like, you know, have one, like for instance, if you're trying to find a spanning tree, you'd like everybody to eventually find the same spanning tree in your network, not two different spanning trees. Um, um, but anyway. Um, apps and services live on top, plugins live below. In practice, they all live above because there's, it has no notion of what the difference between an app and a plugin is. Um, um, so that's basically how it works. If you're curious about Yang, um, Yang is basically just um, a really simple uh, uh, um, data description language. Uh, containers are loosely equivalent, to, and this is written for system people, so I might take them to systems languages. You guys probably are better at this. Uh, containers are basically a struct. Um, Lists are actually maps, not lists, which makes no sense in my world, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, they have keys. Uh, leaves are basically primitive types, and you can have things like, and in, in this case, topology ID is actually a string, I think, at the end of the day. It maps down to type defs. 
Um, groupings are loosely interfaces, but they're not actually interfaces because they're not, you don't implement them, you actually subsume them completely into you, and they're not actually something you can refer to independently of themselves. So this language has issues, actually, if, somebody, if real people want to show up and try and help this language, it's defined by the IETF, I would love for real people, like for instance, it doesn't have recursive self-inclusion, you can't have a type include itself, so you can't have a grouping that contains a pointer to a, group, a grouping of the same type, which makes certain properties really painful to define. Um, and I would love to go fix all of those things, um, but I, I'm only one human. Um, so having other people go try and fix some of this would be huge. Um, and if you did fix it, the cool part is huge amounts of the networking industry are moving towards their devices being exposed and programmable completely in this language. Um, so the, you know, if, you, if you're interested in networking in these programming languages, this might be an interesting place to go stab. Um, and uh, so that's sort of, um, there's lots of other things. You can have type defs, there are pointers. You can have constraints about the types. I think you can even constrain what pointers point to and things like that. You can say it must point to something below here in the tree. Um, it's, 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 it's interesting, it's worth poking around. Um, the fact that there are pointers is good. Um, Unless they're references. They're actually, so the whole thing is a, is a XML, uh, the whole thing is basically an XML document at the end of the day. It's all one giant XML document. Um, and as a consequence, they're not pointers, they are X paths. Um, so I don't know if that makes it better or worse. Um, uh, but they're not actually pointers, they're actually strings which are X paths which can be evaluated in order to go find another point in the tree. Which may or may not still exist. <laughs> um, uh, the whole thing is written in Java um, and, and I'm sort of, uh, this is I just thought, so open data is all written in Java. Uh, people ask why. The obvious answer is it's what it was started in, so we're still running with it. Um, I think the more deep answer is that um, uh, realistically, we had about 40 companies looking to hire an average 10 or 15 developers each in order to go work on this and ship product on it. And Java developers are A, easy to find, B, reasonably priced, and C, they're somewhat safe when they go write code. It's, uh, um, I, and, and you guys will laugh, but I mean, it's a lot better than C, right? Like, you know, they're not gonna, uh, uh, there are other languages which theoretically you can go find people that can write in, but in practice, when you try and take their code and get anything done with it, it breaks even worse than Java. Um, uh, so, so the loose analogy I used last night when I was talking to Sriram was sort of like CUDA. Um, we, we use CUDA at OpenCL, not because it's a good language, but because it happens to run well on something which is heavily subsidized. Um, <laughs> uh, we use Java developers because it happens to be Java. We use Java because Java happens to run well on something which is reasonably, you know, which is heavily, which is very common, heavily subsidized by other people, which is Java talent. Um, uh, I don't know how completely true this is, but this has sort of been my having tried to hire developers. This is where I come into industry. Having tried to hire real developers that write code, the process of hiring developers that understand languages other than Java well is miserable. Um, and, and hard. Anyway, would we change anything else? Not everywhere, but in some places inside of this, I could imagine us picking up DSLs pretty quickly, especially if they make actual problems easier for actual developers working inside of Open Daylight. So if you can come in and go find a place where it is that people are struggling to do things, like for instance, we have a whole lot of places where we have a Yang model on the top and a Yang model on the bottom, and all we're doing is writing stupid simple code that's translating from Yang model one to Yang model two. If you came up with a DSL that did that quickly and easily, which I'm sure there's a thousand of, people would go pick it up and run with it. And if you could also slip interesting poison pills in with it that would make us, let us move away from doing everything in Java, that would be fantastic. Um, um, so this sort of gets us into, I'm going to talk about, um, how am I doing on time? 15 minutes, okay. Um, when I was about, so if you just pull out the headline bullets, I tried to think about what are the hardest, what are the grand challenges in SDN? What are the things that we don't actually know how to solve quickly and easily um, that, are, that are sort of flowing around? This is about three years ago, and I basically had four. Uh, it was sort of the centralized versus distributed, to, you know, how do you build centra logically centralized but actually distributed things? and keep the programming abstraction of centralization and make it possible to write SDN apps. Um, uh, the migration to SDN, which is like, how do I actually deploy it in my network with some confidence? Because otherwise, you're basically telling me, please replace 40 years of relatively good engineering with something that seven hipsters in a basement came up with over the course of the past five years. And that's not quite true, but it's somewhat true. How do I conceive that's okay? Um, application composition is almost, you know, is I think probably the, the hardest problem, and there's lots of languages attempts at it. I, w I, I, I would love to, and, and at least four of them are currently in open daylight, um, which doesn't, which actually makes the problem worse. Um, on hardware diversity, which is sort of what I, we, we talked about earlier, which is like, just can't. 
Like right now, there's no way of, without knowing a priori what hardware you're going to run on in practice, it doesn't work. Um, and underneath here, I have the sort of bullet points for people where, where what Open Daily has sort of done to try and solve these. Um, in a normal talk, I would say, this is great. Look, Open Daily is tackling all of the hard problems. Um, in this group, what I'll tell you is that not very well. Um, <laughs> uh, we sort of have the hackiest, systemsiest approach to all of these problems that you could try and go after. Um, but, the, but I think we acknowledge the existence of these problems, which is one step forward towards solving them. And I think we, you know, anybody that had interesting solutions to this space that could plug in in places would be hugely useful. Do any examples come to mind for um, application composition? Paretic. Heretic is the most sort of best known, which is, it's basically an extension of frenetic in order to try and handle exactly that, which is trying to be able to write snippets of code that can be joined together. But it's less, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding of heretic is that it's less about trying to have two mutually ignorant applications be able to interact with each other cleanly and more about how do I build Unix-like small programs and then compose them together in order to build larger programs. Which is, which the harder problem which I'd like to see is like, I want to be able to have somebody write a traffic engineering application which is going to swing traffic left and right across my network and have somebody else write a tap application which is going to try and find particular flows and divert them. And those two things should be, co should be able to coexist in practice, though, right, like, you know, at least programming at the open flow level, you can't do that because you would have to track, like, where is that person sending that flow? And you sort of trying to figure out how to get two programs that logically should compose but are unaware of each other and get them to compose without interactions by the user or by the person deploying it um, is hard. This is where, and, and so I, I, there's lots of language approaches to trying to attack this problem. Um, they've, generally speaking, made the assumption that they control everything, which is another problem. Um, but anyway. Uh, does that sort of answer your question? Um, uh, so the first qu the first challenge I was talking about is that how, how do we get from here to there? Um, how do you deploy SDN when it's not uh, greenfield? Uh, some of it is that you basically just interoperate with the existing protocols. Just speak, like be SDN on the inside, be traditional networks on the outside. And the translation is painful, but it can be done. Uh, the, uh, and apparently I have... I don't know if I rehearsed timing or something like that. Um, then there's sort of this trust and stability issue, which is how I can actually believe that this stuff is going to work. These last two, which is provide better visibility, debugging, and do model checking and verification, this is stuff we've actually done a really good job at um, in, in, in making the programming languages community. And apparently, I have rehearsed timings on. Give me one second. Um, slideshow. I don't know why they turned that on by default. There we go. OK. Um, so this is places where I think actually the idea that you can tell me, the, the, the idea that you can do provable properties of my new networks, which is something I could never do in the past, um, means that actually you might counteract some of the resistance towards deploying new stuff by giving people actual proofs that it's going to work. Um, I think this is happening in practice. I know of at least two startups whose entire business model is basically, we will enable you to trustfully, tr in a trusted way, move to SDN by doing this. Um, uh, so like this is like flow logs, exodus, um, and header space analysis. A couple of their things have done some of this. Just like translate legacy SDN to platforms, sort of with the same semantics that run on OpenFlow, which is kind of a really cool approach. Um, this works pretty well when everything is SDN enabled, so you have your OpenFlow network. Um, uh, um, if you start adding in things that are sort of at the edge that aren't OpenFlow related, um, this, some of this breaks down and there's interesting problems in this space, which are how do you actually extend your language to deal with, uh, essentially the runtimes for these things to deal with the fact that not everything is under your control. Um, for example, and similarly, this is true, and in this case, you might argue, just deploy OpenFlow everywhere and it'll eventually fall, solve itself. But there are things, the middle boxes, and I think there's people that are give talks tomorrow, but the, the middle boxes are almost certainly never going to come into this same framework. They do too much weird things in too many different ways that in reality, you're going to have to model them as something outside of the SDN controller's realm for some time to come. And figuring out how to do that in a sane way that you can maintain nice properties about reachability when basically what you're doing is saying here um, would be interesting. Uh, and just as a concrete example, um, so um, when you're running, if you're interacting with other code at like the L2 level, you want to avoid having routing loops. And the way you do that is you send BPDUs in the spanning tree protocol. Um, and so what you'd actually do in order to interact correctly here is you would send BPDUs and speak the spanning tree protocol to the outside world. Um, and if you don't get the ordering constraints right, um, you can you know you can end up with a loop there. 
you can end up with it being disconnected, connected, who knows? And so trying just to make sure how to fold some of that stuff into your systems is, is, is somewhat painful. Um, the other thing is about loops. Loops are, transient loops kill everything. Like I just don't like, like, like if you loop for a little bit, actually this loop might be okay, but in practice what happens is loops are problematic for multicast traffic or broadcast traffic. And broadcast traffic will replicate itself each time through the loop if you have more than one loop. Um, and so, uh, the result is that you can go from like zero to having your entire network be locked up with broadcast traffic in seconds, um, in milliseconds in some cases. And so that's why like, you know, short loops are much, much, much more harmful than you would expect them to be because unless you can prove sort of that you're not going to, you're not, you're, that you're eventually, you eventually can drain the traffic before it floods your entire network. Um, uh, centralization versus distributed stuff. Um, this is, uh, um, so this is a largely, like if you look at like Chubby, Chubby has a really good way to solve this problem, which is like, you know, strongly, we'll do something strongly consistent, we'll agree on a lock, and basically the reason we don't care about the cap theorem is because the side of the partition that can talk to the internet is the only side of the partition I care about. <laughs> and so if you can talk, like, so and if, and if two sides of the partition can talk to the internet, they're not partitioned by definition, um, <laughs> uh, unless the entire internet is partitioned. And so that's a really nice, and so in practice, that's how we sidestep this whole centralization versus distributed, strongly consistent, weakly consistent thing at large scale. But in practice, with net networks don't give you that free out. Like, just because you're partitioned doesn't mean that I can give up my local networking connectivity because I can't reach the internet. I would like to still be able to do my backups and things like that even if I don't have internet access. Um, and uh, so it, it gets to be a much harder problem in networking and I think it's more interesting. So there's a more interesting space to explore relaxations of strong consistency but still trying to maintain this logical centralization in this space. Um, and um, uh, this is sort of, and, and then there's sort of the other thing I mentioned before, which is um, I'd like to maintain different parts of my controller at different levels of consistency. Um, and I think that's going to really matter, which is I'd like to be able to say, have certain things which are strongly consistent so everybody uses them all the time. I'd like to have other things which are maybe more loose because they're really local to only a certain area. But you'd like to still have certain properties where, I mean, the reason we like strong consistency, it's not because I like things being slow, it's because I don't know humans that can write code that works against eventually consistent data stores and behaves. Um, uh, or I know very few of them. Um, and so how do you try and get behavior to be convergent despite the fact that your data store might be not convergent is, um, and is Ehrman one answer? I have no idea. If you could basically say the output of, like just express the behavior as data that you store somewhere and that way you can at least discover that you've diverged and do something about it. Um, uh, one of the problems is at least in most of these systems we don't, the behavior isn't modeled in any way, so you can't, there's nowhere to go, like, like, like the behavior is the running execution of this JVM. Um, and so having any way to introspect the complete state of this JVM to know, are these two these processes conver diverged or are they doing the same thing is really, really hard to understand. Um, hardware diversity, um, this is sort of what we talked about earlier. Um, uh, and, um, this is, this is the thing which has spent the most intellectual cycles. I'll actually talk about some technical details here. So OpenFlow 1.0 provided the lowest common denominator API, which is basically you have one table. It can match on anything you want. It can take any of the actions that OpenFlow could take, and you're done. And so the result is it sort of looked the same everywhere, but it also had this really nasty problem, which was that in practice, the real hardware you could build with OpenFlow only had about a thousand rules worth of capacity for that kind of rule. Um, and it was because it was all based on the Broadcom Trident and Trident 2 chipsets, which happened to have very small TCAMs, um, which were really designed to do like, you know, ACLs in switches, not, not this kind of thing. And that's where, and there's a whole tree of papers in academia, which are based on the idea that rules are expensive, um, which is, only about a third true. Um, they're just, the, the very flexible kinds of rules are expensive. It turns out rules and switches are actually pretty free if you do the right kind of rules, like destination MAC address based forwarding. Even the cheapest switch you can buy right now is you know, 128,000 entries for that kind of thing. Like your, um, and so that's a radically different world to live in. And so basically, trying to expose all of this, sort of these interesting kinds of rules and tables, um, without burdening developers and understand deep, deep understanding of every single device and how people have chosen to expose the features of that device is basically impossible. <laughs> um, uh, and I've only, there are sort of two attempts that I'm aware of that are sort of seemingly credible 
One of them takes sort of the clean slate approach, which is the P4 project, which I'm not sure if anybody's familiar of. It's sort of Nick McEwen and Jennifer Rexford's next foray into trying to redefine the way Nestian is done. Are you also involved? Oh, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, and 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 there. And P4 is really about hey, let's build um, let's build new hardware that that is. Let's build new hardware that, 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 that is more programmable, and then the hardware diversity problem will go away, which is that we should redefine networking hardware to look a lot like, more like x86 hardware and sort of have common, very low-level instruction sets, and hopefully this will make the problem go away. Um, there are huge numbers of smart people involved in it, so I have to believe that there is belief that it will be successful. It's hard for me to imagine that telling the entire networking industry, just reinvent your whole lowest level hardware so that way it all speaks the same, the same instruction set. And don't worry, it won't impact any of what's going on. Seems like a really, really hard sell. Uh, so, and, and at the end of the day, you do need the people that are actually building networking hardware on board to actually get this stuff to work. So I don't know how that's going to work. And the second one is sort of something which I've been working on. It's a lot less ambitious. But I think it's deployable today, and sort of there's some of the building blocks are there, which is something called TTPs or table type patterns, and they're really just a way to express pipelines in OpenFlow 1.3. So in OpenFlow 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, everything since then, there have been multiple tables, and they can be sort of pipelined. But the issue is when you have multiple tables, different tables are allowed to have different properties, so you can only match on some things in one table, only take certain actions in another table, and that basically gave you, you know, an exponentially large set of possible pipelines to go program, and uh, nobody knows how to do about that. And in practice, every vendor has gone off and implemented their own OpenFlow 1.3 pipeline on their own volition in their own way. So even when you have two different vendors that have the same ASIC at the bottom of them, <laughs> they have exposed that ASIC in two or three different ways. Um, and sometimes multiple ways per vendor, which is they actually have different ways to bring it up, and when it comes up in different ways, it has different tables. Uh, I have a basic question on this. Uh, is the hardware pipeline programmable? Um, in some of them it is, in some of them it isn't. Um, so for instance, there's Intel, Intel, uh, it used to be Fulcrum. So there's a company called Fulcrum, Intel bought them, they have something called FlexPipe, which is actually what they have is they have a programmable parser, and they have a whole bunch of, of um, SRAMs that will, uh, that will look up. So you can basically say, I want you, here's a parser that will find the DMAC field, no matter where it is in a packet, or the maybe, I don't think it only goes 512 bits into the packet, or maybe it's, I forget how far it goes. But um, you might be able to pull out like an HTTP header if you were really fancy about it and it was close enough, but it might be hard. And then basically they have, um, you, can, you can rename those fields and once you read it in order because you've parsed them out, and then you can do matches on those fields. And so that's somewhat programmable, and that's one of the targets for P4 is to try and program FlexPipe, although I think that they've mostly abandoned the programming existing hardware and moved towards, we're just going to invent new hardware. Um, so OpenFlow allows you to like, have a pretty flexible pipeline, uh, I think, since 1.3 or so. 1.1 on, it has, it has flexible pipelines, and that's sort of been a double-edged sword, which is like, on the one hand, you can theoretically expose lots of functionality. On the other hand, nobody knows how to program it, uh, or at least in, a, in, a, in an independent way. Like, you want hardware portability. That was, like, one of, there were sort of three things that SDN promised. It promised higher-level abstractions. It promised you know, access to all of the prior the device had, regardless of whether it was intended to be exposed, and it argued that the programs that you're going to write using that were going to be portable across hardware. And, and um, I think we, we've had a pretty crappy track record on all three, to be honest, uh, but the last one certainly is the one we failed the most, which is that there is basically no hardware portability whatsoever in, a mo in modern SDN if you actually go to deploy it. The only thing that saved us is the fact that everybody's writing stuff to control open vSwitch, and open, there's only one of that, and so as long as you're controlling hypervisors at the edge, you're fine. Um, so anyway, TTP is basically like this. The one cool part is that like there's a whole bunch of companies that have actually written TTPs and described what their forwarding pipeline looks like in a formal way or a semi-formal way. Um, and I'm trying to make it a more formal way since I actually wrote a language and a parser for it. Um, although I did write them in a terrible way. Um, and so I actually have been catching bugs in people's TTPs, trying to make them more machine parsable and actually interpretable. Um, I've been doing a bunch of that inside of Open Daylight. Um, and sort of the question is sort of this is your target language, right? What's your source language? Um, and the source language, um, like, like what, are, what are applications going to admit that you would compile down into flow mods in this? And 
One idea that I've been playing around with is, that could TTPs also be your source language? Which is, could you look at very, very simple forwarding pipelines as the bottom end of an applications program and just map those down onto more complex pipelines? And the answer seems like yes, with a whole bunch of weird things about atomicity, right? Which is that like you're going to end up with interleavings of your different pipelines, and understanding whether or not those interleavings are fine or bad seems horrible. But this seems like a compiler's problem that I could use help solving that should be just trivial, and instead I look at it and it seems impossible to me. It's just, I, a whole, I'll write a whole bunch of heuristics that work in practice. Maybe. Um, but this is sort of the thing which I think, if you could get this working, mo a lot of the hardware vendors that are supporting OpenFlow are really actually starting to write these TL type patterns and describe their pipelines in OpenFlow with the real code that actually runs on the switches today, that you might actually start to be able to get protocol, you get device independence out of your SDN controllers and SDN applications. Yeah. I think that's it. Um, yeah, that was the last slide. I can, I can talk more. And I'm happy to talk about any more of that offline um, or anything in this space.